This video is sponsored by Nebula, the educational streaming service created by me and my creator friends. Check out the link in the description or stay tuned to learn more. I and a lot of other transit lovers spend a lot of time talking about huge cities and their impressive transit networks, from Shanghai to Paris and Tokyo. But the city we should spend far more time talking about is Seoul, with an impressive and well thought out metro, light metro, suburban railway, and BRT system that is also rapidly expanding its transit options. So let's get on board and see all that Seoul's incredible transport system has to offer. Seoul is a huge city, which is part of why it took me so long to do a video on it. The region it sits within and is deeply interconnected with has over 25 million residents, about half of South Korea's population. I've actually visited the city before, but getting a grasp on it is really hard. Seoul is surrounded by and pockmarked by mountains, and divided into north and south by the Han River. And like fellow Asian megacity Tokyo, Seoul really has multiple central business districts or CBDs most notably around Seoul Station, just west of the massive Namsan Park, at the center of the city, Gangnam, south of the Han River, and Yeouido and the Greater Yangdongpo area, which is the main finance and government district with the National Assembly as well as many offices sitting on an island in the river. The city is sprawling and decentralized, with a number of other large cities and new towns such as Incheon to the southwest, which have effectively merged into a megalopolis. And if you've ever heard of the Songdo Smart City, that's actually a district within Incheon. And if you, like me, are fascinated by skyscrapers, the Latte World Tower, the world's sixth tallest, is in the southeast of the city, adjacent to Latte World Theme Park and Mall, as well as the Olympic Park located just to the east, from the 1988 Summer Olympics hosted right in the city. It's also important to point out the almost unbelievable density of parts of Seoul. It's common around the city and suburbs to see parcels of land developed with 10 or 20 high-rises packed together, often but not always directly served by rapid transit. Because while Seoul is awesome for its rapid transit, it also has a crazy number of major roads and highways, and is building far more in the suburbs, particularly south of the city. I remember traveling from Tokyo to Seoul and being shocked at the size of the streets and the amount of traffic. The car culture is real here. The roads do often also have nutty BRTs with more buses than I think I've ever seen anywhere else, including in Latin America. Seoul has two major airports. Incheon, the main international hub, is roughly 50 kilometers west of Seoul Station, on an island off the coast of its namesake city. It has four runways and moved over 70 million people per year pre-pandemic, and has all kinds of crazy on-site amenities, including several golf courses. Much closer to the urban core is Gimbo Airport, which mostly serves domestic travel, has two runways, and moved around 25 million passengers per year pre-pandemic. That's around as many people as Vancouver Airport. Of course, the city also has a number of major railway stations that tend to be hubs for not only high-speed rail, but also regional and urban rail services as well. These include, but are not limited to Yongsan, Seoul, near the Seoul Station CBD, obviously, and Cheongnangi stations north of the Han, as well as Yeongdongpo and Suseo stations south of the Han River, near the Yeouido and Gangnam CBDs respectively. So those are most of the major destinations I wanted to mention, so you have a rough idea of just a bit of the geography of Seoul. From here, let's dive into the Seoul Metropolitan Subway, which can get really confusing because it has several components. The urban subways of Seoul and Incheon, various suburban rail lines, typically run by Korail, Korea's national railway, and a number of light metro lines, connecting different neighborhoods and destinations. I should say that almost universally, and with all new urban rail projects, platform screen doors are included, and most stations on Seoul's rapid transit system also have public washrooms. There's also ubiquitous Wi-Fi and 5G cellular service. These amenities help to make Seoul's metro among the world's most accessible and best connected, but also just a pleasure to use. With screen doors and Wi-Fi, the transport element of this mass transit system almost completely fades away. In Seoul, urban subway lines run on the right and almost always have a 1500 volt DC overhead power system with a top speed of 80 km per hour, while core rail lines run on the left and typically run with 25 kV AC electrification at speeds of up to around 110 km per hour. From here on out, I'll only mention electrification or speed when it differs from these norms. And I should mention that all conventional steel wheeled rail lines in Seoul have standard gauge tracks. 
Now, diving into the metro, this network forms the core rapid transit service in the city, with large trains, frequent service, and fairly dense stops. While lines do extend into the suburbs, they all spend a fairly substantial part of their lengths in the dense urban core. The first line in the Seoul metro we'll talk about is the most used line, Line 2. This line is 60 kilometers long with 51 stations, and forms a massive central loop within Seoul, crossing the Han River twice, and connecting the three CBDs. The line has two branches, which act more like shuttles, connecting to the main line, with shorter trains when compared to the 10 car ones used on the loop. If you're curious, most Seoul Metro and Core Rail lines use rail cars that are about 3.1 meters wide and 19.5 meters long, similar to but wider than urban trains in Tokyo. Several sections of Line 2 are above ground on elevated viaducts, including the eastern section crossing the Han, the southwest, and some of the northern branch. The line also connects to numerous other urban rail services and the Olympic Park area, and has a slightly higher than normal 90 km per hour top speed. Line 3 is a 57 km 44 station line, running from the northwest to southeast, connecting to Suseo Station. Most of the line is underground, though it does pop above ground a few times, including when it crosses the river. Line 3 does have through running onto the Core Rail Ilsan line, but given it's electrified at 1500 volts DC and runs on the right, it is more or less captive to Line 3. Trains on the route are 10 cars long, and as with other lines in Seoul and cities like Shanghai, many services end before the terminal, in what's called a short turn. Line 4 has 51 stations over 72 kilometers, running from the northeast to the southwest of the region, connecting to Seoul Station in the middle. The northern part of the route is almost all underground, with short sections popping above, although the southern part of the route is almost all above ground, short of tunnels traveling under hills. Not long after passing south of the Han River, the line's tracks swap orientation underground, to align with Core Rail's left hand running, and power shifts to 25 kV AC. The trains, which are dual mode, are also 10 cars long, and can go faster on the suburban sections at up to 100 km per hour. And there are actually passing loops to enable express services. The line does all of this as it shares a portion of its route with the Core Rail Suen Bundang line, which we will discuss later. Metro Line 5 has 57 stations along a 63km entirely underground east-west corridor across Seoul, crossing the Han twice and splitting into two branches in the east. The line connects to Gimpo Airport at its west end, Yeouido, and the Olympic Park on its southern branch at the east end. The other branch follows the river northeast, connecting Hanam to Seoul. Trains on Line 5 are 8 cars long. Line 6 is a 39 station, 36 km line, running east-west across Seoul, north of the Han in a broad U-shape, almost entirely underground. Very uniquely, on the west end of the line, there's a one-directional counterclockwise loop with a number of single-platform stations, while the easternmost station on the line is an above-ground single-track terminal adjacent to the line's main yard that receives a limited service, but perhaps helps to offset the inconvenience of situating a train yard near residents. This line uses 8-car trains. Running 60 km with 53 stations, Line 7 connects from Seoul's northeast across the Han, where it connects to Gangnam before continuing west all the way to Incheon, where it connects to both of its two metro lines. Like Lines 5 and 6, Line 7 uses all 8-car trains, and the line is also essentially fully underground, depending on whether you count the yards and tracks on a lower deck of a road bridge over the Han as being above ground. Like with Line 6, the northernmost terminal station on Line 7 has a single platform next to the line's main yard, which receives some limited service. Line 8 is the shortest of the Seoul Metro lines, with just 18 stations over 18 km of track, and it runs relatively short 6 car trains to match. The entire line is south of the Han in the southeast quadrant of the city, with only one above ground station. Seoul Line 9, which is covered in logos for Metro 9, the operating company, is a 41 km 38 station line traveling east west south of the Han, akin to Line 6 to the north, connecting Gimpo Airport, Yeouido, Gangnam, and the Olympic Park. The line is entirely underground, short of its terminal and westernmost station, and has local and express trains with passing loops at some stations. This project was actually implemented as a P3 and has had lots of issues, as planners underestimated ridership and the initial fare scheme was actually disintegrated. It's quite a complex situation, though there is a great article about some of the problems by Xiang Li on their substack. 
The last Seoul Metro line, and also the most complex line, is Line 1, which is a 200 km 97 station beast of a line more complicated than many cities' entire metros. The deceptive thing about Line 1 is that only 9 km and 10 stations worth of line is really a traditional urban subway running between Seoul Station and Cheongyang Yi Station. The 1500 volt DC portion of the line is limited to the central tunnel, and most of the line operates at 25 kV AC power instead. The entire line runs on the left as per core rail standards. Because Line 1 runs between two of Seoul's biggest stations onto the approach tracks on either side, it also connects several other major stations like Yangsan. The line is essentially made up of three legs. The line to the north of Cheongyang Yi is the through running Gyeongwon line. Meanwhile, from the south of Seoul Station, the branches run together to Guro, where some services split onto the Gyeong In line to Incheon and others to the Gyeong Bu line, the legacy main line to Busan. Those services in that direction actually terminate by diverting onto the Zhanghang line in Cheonan. Actual local train services run from various points on the north end of the northern leg to Incheon, as well as points slightly further south on the northern leg to points along the southern leg, including a branch to Xiangdong Tan. There's also a shuttle between Yangdong Po and Guangmian. On top of the local services, there are numerous express trains that can pass slower local trains on the outer rail corridors, which are usually at least quad track. Since these tracks are also used for some freight, regional, and intercity trains, you can sometimes see freight trains passing through metro stations with platform screen doors, which is really unique. Express services run from various points on the northern leg to Incheon, including a super express service which makes few stops as well as various points on the southern leg to Seoul Station and Cheongyang Yi. The express service pattern for each of the three legs is completely distinct. Local services use both Corel and Seoul Metro trains, while express services generally use Corel trains only. Fun fact, as it turns out, the famous Cheonggyecheon Linear Park, that used to be the site of an elevated urban highway, also heavily depended on new metro services on Seoul Line 1 and 2 that run directly to the north and south of it, along with other metro lines and BRT services to provide alternative means of transportation through and to the area, far in excess of the former expressway. The last true urban subway in Seoul we need to talk about is the Shunbundang Line. The project is technically speaking a suburban line, but given its highly urban character, I've decided to include it here. The route is a fully automated 33km 16 station express subway, given its wide station spacing and unusually high top speed of 90km per hour, starting in Gangnam and running south through a mountain pass to towns south of Seoul, entirely underground short of its southern terminus, relieving congestion on other transport links. The line is electrified at 25 kV AC and it currently uses 6 car trains, though the stations like many in the city are future proof to accommodate up to 10 car trains. Now if you enjoy this video and want to see more like it, make sure you're subscribed to the channel, turn on notifications, like the video, and consider supporting me on Patreon. Every bit helps. Next up we have the Incheon Subway, which has two very different lines. The subway plays a similar role for Incheon as the Seoul Metro does for Seoul, but it's rather limited in size, meaning other urban and suburban lines pick up much of the slack in this part of the region. Incheon Line 1 uses 8 car subway trains which are narrower than those used on Seoul Metro, on a mostly underground north-south alignment which swings northwest at its southern end to serve Songdo. Meanwhile, Line 2 uses two car automated trains with Talus signaling powered by a 750 volt DC third rail akin to Vancouver's Canada Line. The route swings west at its north end and east at the south end, forming a giant S with a number of elevated sections and connects to Line 1 at Incheon City Hall. Both lines are surrounded by crazy high density tower development and go through some areas that you might not expect to see at Metro, like industrial districts. Both lines are linked to Line 1 and Line 7 of the Seoul Metro. The widest reaching rail network in the region is most certainly the suburban lines that crisscross Seoul and generally have wide gaps between stations, as well as different service levels such as express trains. Because these routes are built with AC electrification and mainline standards, freight, and perhaps more importantly, intercity trains such as the high speed KTX can operate over them meaning they function a lot like new build versions of the suburban sections of Metro Line 1, not only connecting urban areas, but also providing a link for intercity services from further afield. 
The first route I'll talk about is the through running Jonggi Jongan line, which is a total of 134 kilometers long with 57 stations, running from the far northwest, the Jonggi part, to the east, the Jongan part. The line runs so far northwest that there's actually a shuttle to Dorsan Station near the demilitarized zone with North Korea. Heading into the city from the north, tracks go into a four-track tunnel, part of which was built cut and cover with a linear park on top of it, and at the eastern end of the tunnel are connections used for access by infrequent services to Seoul Station. Heading further south and east, tracks follow Nihon, with stops at Yangsan and Cheonggang-yi. Lots of express services operate with speeds of up to 110 km per hour. Trains run express on one of the two lines before turning local as they continue across the city, and are 8 cars long. Next up is the Suen Bundang Line, which runs 105 km with 63 stations forming a gigantic southern U around the Seoul metropolitan area. The route was created by combining the previously separate Suen and Bundang Lines, the former being suburban in nature and the latter being much more urban. In the west, the line begins from Incheon and a connection with Metro Line 1, before heading south, passing near but not really through Songdo, despite having a station named after it. From here, the line goes above ground, heading east through a shared section of tracks with Line 4 of the Seoul Metro. Some sections of this southern portion of the route are in cut and cover tunnels with parks on top, as with the section on the Gyeong E Line. This really stands out because despite being suburban areas 30 kilometers from central Seoul, these sections and neighborhoods look and act a lot like urban areas with a subway, and can frankly be found on all manner of suburban lines in Seoul, attributable both to the pretty well considered planning, which lets tunnels travel under roads and be built cut and cover, as well as very low construction costs even when that can't be done. Following the mostly above ground southern section, the line turns north to run through Yangin to Suseo Station, and further north to Cheongyangyi. Express services do run on the line, but they tend to only operate on portions of the route such as the southeast and the west. Trains are 6 cars long and can run at up to 100 km per hour. Probably the first transit line many ride when arriving in Seoul is the Airex, or Airport Railroad Express, a 64km 14 station suburban line that runs west from underground platforms at Seoul Station, on two tracks of the four track tunnel used by the Gyeong Yi Jung An line, before popping above ground to cross the Han, then diving into another underground station at Gimpo Airport, before travelling further west above ground to Incheon Airport. There are two services that run on the Airx line, which like all other suburban lines, is electrified at 25 kV AC. One is a non-stop Seoul station to Incheon Airport Express, including in-town check-in, as with Hong Kong's MTR, and another is a slower commuter service which makes all stops. The six-car trains on the route max out at 110 km per hour, though plans call for increasing speeds to up to 150 km per hour in the future. Like with other suburban lines, by providing a 25 kV electrified line out to the airport, the Airx actually enabled KTX high speed services to run for a time, but unfortunately these services were cut due to low ridership. That being said, that high speed services may use the suburban lines is absolutely included in the calculus of their planning. The Gyeongchun line runs a total of 80 km to Chuncheon, northeast of Seoul, on a line with numerous very impressive bridges and tunnels navigating the mountains, and is rather unique in that its services generally terminate in central Seoul, rather than through operating. Services on the line include the regional ITX, with a top speed of 180 km per hour, and the alignment truly does feel more like a high speed intercity line than suburban or even regional rail. That being said, 8 car local trains do operate frequently, though with most of them terminating some distance from central Seoul, forcing a transfer onto the metro or other regional trains for onward journeys. This is due to a lack of core capacity in the city's rail network, an issue which will be addressed later. As it turns out, there are even more regionally oriented lines that do not connect to central Seoul at all. These generally play the role of being a conduit for longer distance regional and high speed services, but as the suburban network expands, services can also interoperate between the various lines, all built to permissive mainline standards. The Gyeonggang Line has a regional Seoul segment that runs 54 km southeast from a connection to the Shin Bundang and Suen Bundang lines to the city of Gyeoju, mostly above ground but in tunnels as it passes under a number of mountains and hills. There are 18 stations total, often placed in these short sections of track between tunnels, as with the Gyeongchun Line. The top speed of the line for urban service is 110 km per hour, and trains are 4 cars long. Though like most of the regional and suburban lines, the infrastructure is designed and built for longer trains should the need arise. 
The last regional route is this Yohei Line, which runs north-south through the west of the region, almost entirely underground on a 40km 21 station route, from the south of Incheon to the northeast through Gimpo Airport and north to Daegok on the Gyeong-E Line. You can see the consideration of high-speed trains in some of the infrastructure, including wonky platform screen doors, which needed to be designed to be usable by multiple train types, and in some cases additional tracks are even provided to allow a bypass for freight. This route is the beginning of what could be a Suen Bundang Line style U, but to the north of Seoul, effectively forming a giant loop through the suburbs akin to Line 2 in the center city. The line has a top speed of 110 km per hour and currently runs 4 car trains. The last class of rail services we need to talk about are the various people mover and light metro lines throughout Seoul. These typically connect outlying towns or major campuses to the existing urban rail network, but increasingly they're being built to better connect central dense areas with hillside areas that would otherwise be hard to navigate for large trains. All of these lines are driverless, though they use different train technologies, and systems have been built by various cities and even private transit operators. The first of these routes is the 10 station 24km Gimpo Gold Line, which is, surprise surprise, a route that serves the Gimpo area, with two car steel wheeled trains powered by 750V DC third rail power. The route starts from Gimpo Airport and heads northwest, virtually entirely underground. The Silim Line is an 8km 11 station entirely underground line that travels north-south through dense areas of central Seoul south of Yeouido, adding even more subway coverage in this area. Trains are powered by a 750V DC third rail, but are a rubber-tired people mover from Korean industrial company Woojin. The ELRT is not actually an LRT, instead it's an 11km long 13 station automated light metro line powered by a 750V DC third rail with LRT-like articulated rail cars which runs north-south from north-central Seoul into the hills, somewhat like the Seolim line. It also has a fully underground depot at its northern end, which is a first for Korea, and frankly necessitated by the harsh landscapes and dense environments that the entire line travels through. Because you know you aren't cool if your city doesn't have a Vancouver Skytrain type linear induction motor train line, Seoul, and more specifically the outlying area of Yongin has the Yongin Everline, a 750V DC third rail powered line using a Skytrain technology and even the Skytrain door tower which operates wide, one-car trains on an almost entirely elevated alignment east from the Suen Bundang line and then north through the hills to a terminal near Everland theme park. The last of the operating light metros is the U-Line, an 11km 16 station VAL 208 route that connects the city of Weijungbul to Seoul Line 1, sort of like the Yongin Everline. This route is entirely elevated. Now, you'll notice I said operating, because there technically is one more line, the 6km 6 station Incheon Airport Maglev that uses two car urban maglev trains manufactured by Hyundai Rotem, maker of almost every single train mentioned in this video, which are pulled along by linear induction motors and powered by a 1500V DC third rail. The maglev has been closed for some time, but it's set to reopen in 2024, but only really as an attraction. The route connects some of the airport amenities at Incheon International to the terminal itself. Now, if that sounded like a lot, that's because it is. Seoul already has over 20 urban rail lines, and it's building even more, so let's race through them. The biggest project coming to Seoul, and the one that will likely change the world of urban rail transportation in the same way the Paris RER did some 50 years ago, is the GTX, or Great Train Express High Speed Regional Rail Network. The idea of GTX is to provide a deep underground regional express network akin to the RER but with average speeds of 100 km per hour and top speeds of around 160 km per hour. And while the Paris RER through operates on two legacy suburban rail lines, the GTX will through run onto high speed and modern regional train lines, allowing for lightning fast travel. And while many individual high-speed regional lines are being built in other cities in Asia, like Delhi, Shenzhen, and Chengdu, no city, with the possible exception of Guangzhou, seems to be building as cohesive of an overall network. GTX will have three lines, connecting at three points in central Seoul to form a triangle transfer at Seoul Station, Samsung, and Cheongyangi. GTX-A will run from Kintex, the Korean International Exhibition Center, and Unjong in the northwest to Seoul Station, Samsung, and Suseo before continuing south on the same tracks used by SRT high-speed trains into that station. 
GTXB will travel from Songdo in the southwest through Incheon to Yeouido, Yongsan, Seoul Station, and Cheonggangi, before through running east onto the Gyeongchun Line, which as you might recall has to terminate some of its trains outside of central Seoul because of a lack of core capacity. The GTX should fix this problem. The last full line will be the GTXC, which will run from Gyeokjong on Line 1, south to Cheonggangi and Samsung before heading southwest. On top of the GTX, Seoul is building several other new urban rail lines. These include the Wirya Line, which is Seoul's first actual tram line from the end of Metro Line 5 to the southwest in two branches, connecting to Line 8 and the Suen Bundang lines. To some extent it feels like this line is being built because yep, Hyundai Rotom now builds trams, including for Edmonton. The Dongbuk Line, which is a new north-south ELRT style light metro line from Wangsimni to the north, paralleling Line 4 for much of its length. And the Sinansan Line, which is a new suburban rail line traveling southwest from Seoul Station to Yeouido, before connecting with Line 1 at Gwamnyang and connecting to and through operating with the Siohei Line. And there are even more lines which we don't have time to cover. Existing lines will also be expanded. Line 1 will go further north, with line upgrades happening on its current northern end. Meanwhile, the Siohei Line will be extended even further north along the Gyeong-E Line to Ilsan. Incheon Line 1 will be extended north to Gimpo, and Line 8 will also be finally extended north, crossing the Han and connecting to several suburban rail lines. Line 7 and 9 will also get northern extensions up to the RX and the U Line and Line 5 respectively. And finally, the Gyeonggang Line will be extended further west in the direction of Incheon, further augmenting the Suen Bundang Line. If that felt like a lot, it's because, well, it is. Seoul already has well over 700 rapid transit stations and is building more every year, in what is one of the most impressive and expansive urban rail development programs in the world. And unlike other Asian megacities like Shanghai, the planning actually feels really coherent, and the city actually finally has a relatively young regional planning agency that had been discussed for decades prior, with heavy metro serving dense urban areas, suburban rail linking areas together, and feeding longer distance services while automated metro fills the gaps, watch out Tokyo, cause Seoul is coming. Now if you've made it to the end of the video, you must be at least a little bit interested in how the world's transit systems work, and enjoy learning about public transit and infrastructure in depth. And if you're curious about how to get started with creating educational stories and projects in an engaging way, or just telling your friends and family about what you've just learned about Seoul's transit system without them drifting off to sleep, I'd recommend Simon Clark's Turn Data Into Stories class to help you with creative storytelling about the facts and data that interest you. And you can watch it right now as part of Nebula Classes, which now comes free as part of your Nebula-based subscription. Nebula is the streaming platform owned by me and my creator friends, featuring over 14,000 titles that you can watch ad-free, including exclusive and early access videos from myself, as well as Not Just Bikes, City Nerd, and City Beautiful. This is one of the best ways you can support my channel and my content as a whole, and now you can get a Nebula subscription for as low as $2.50 a month or $30 annually. So go check out Nebula at nebula.tv slash rmtransit or click the link in the description right now.